that's enough that we had taylor swift write us a brand new song for our show ai everywhere all at once welcome everybody to the show today's gonna be fun we have a lot of new updates on ai for you a lot of cool updates from spring q that uh ended uh, about a week and a half ago and a lot a lot a lot of digital media literacy because april fool's day was yesterday and we get to look at some of those posts and dissect whether they were ai created or not uh, let's go ahead and do a round table real quick on introducing ourselves my name is joe marquez director of academic innovation for q and to my right left i can't tell what these boxes uh dr mattis go ahead and introduce yourself Hey, everybody. Welcome to our seventh episode of AI is Everything Everywhere All at Once. This is super cool. And yeah, yesterday was April Fool's. It's no joke on that one. And really glad to be part of this conversation as the Digital Equity Broadband Coordinator on behalf of the California Department of Education. It's a it's it's been really amazing working alongside the brilliant, intelligent Cat Goyette, who is below us in the Hollywood Squares. Cat, take it away. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh Christina, you are always so kind in your introductions. Um, and yes, I am uh, Catherine Goyette, uh, you can call me Kat, and I am the computer science coordinator for CDE and also uh, support with AI and STEAM and all sorts of other things. And uh, we are so excited to be here because we were just at Spring Q last, um, last week, two yes. weeks ago. It's a blur. It's, it's a blur. It's, it's a, a it, yeah, things are a bit busy right now, but we are glad to be here um, and to partner with Q to talk about these things that are super, super important for our students. And thank you, yeah. Emily. Yeah, thank you, Emily. You know, everybody, th we this is a live show. This isn't pre recorded and just airing out. This is a live show. Please post in the comments if you're on Facebook or Twitter X, I call it Twix, uh, or uh, YouTube, post in there, but also look at the bottom. Ask any question at any time at qlearns.org slash A-I-E-E-A-A-O. Uh, and then you can we can answer those questions live on the air. But for now, go ahead and post them in the chats on your uh, selected social that you're watching right now. And, and yes, yesterday was April Fool's Day. And I was on pins and needles because with all the AI that we have right now, it, it is amazing at what can be created at a moment's notice. And I thought there was going to be tons of AI generated content. And a lot of, if there were tons, they were hard <laughs> to tell. Now, I'm not saying that the April Fool's joke was hard to tell it was April Fool's, but whether it was AI generated or not, that was hard to tell. Uh, so what I wanted to do was post some images of, of some of the uh, things that I saw. And I want to pick it apart. Whether you think it was made by Photoshop or somebody actually created it from scratch, or if you think they used an AI tool to generate it. And April 2nd, I think from this day forward, should go forward as digital media literacy check day, right? Just check to see if something's true or not. And 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 I also think this should point us in the direction that even though April 2nd is a good day to check on true things every second of the day. Every second that we look at something online, we should now question whether it was AI generated or human generated. Give a little bit more uh, of, of a look, right? So let me show you a few that I thought was fun. Now, of course, because Taylor Swift wrote our theme song, no, not really, everybody, okay? That was Suno.ai. We posted that last week, and so many people have joined Suno that you can't even use it anymore on the free version because so many people are using it. It's amazing. They upgraded to version three. It is absolutely phenomenal. Go check it out. Uh, but uh, Taylor Swift, right? Here was a post that was online and it says, and this was Taylor Swift, a video of her and her voice saying that she teamed up with La Crusette, uh, the, uh, the potware company, and saying that she's giving away a free 20-piece cookware set. So people were like, oh, this is amazing. Um, well, we know that's not true. So we know that is an April Fool's Day joke. But how would we determine whether this was really Taylor Swift or not? Um, so, Christina, how would you, looking at this image, how would you say, what would you say to look at? To be like, is this a real Taylor Swift or is it not? You know, I, when I post, I don't really filter anything. And this looks very filtered, very airbrushed. And 
Um, I think after watching the Taylor Swift concert on the TV as many times as, as I have already, her jawline doesn't look right to me. Um, so that's my critical view on that. I don't think it's her. I, this is fake. Yeah, I, I would agree. Cap, Cap, what about you? What would you be looking at to determine whether this is really Taylor Swift or not? Well, I'll be honest. I'm not a, I would have to compare because I am not a Swifty, though I respect oh, those that choose to be. And so I'm not real familiar with, you know, the details uh, of, of her appearance and her voice and such. So I would, but what I would want to do is compare, but you know, something I see in the, in the chat here on YouTube is Mark Lowndes is saying, we can't tell anymore with the best AI image generators. And he's an experienced picture editor. So, you know, to be honest, Joe, I don't know that I would be able to tell again, though. I mean, it, it's got it. Does it ring true with their character, with things they've posted before? That side, sort of a thing is probably, I think, a better way to tell because AI image, AI generators in general are going to just keep getting better. So oh, we've yeah. got to find other ways to fact check sometimes. I mean, yeah. it used to be that when you would, you would create an AI image of a human. It always looked a little creepy and they kind of messed up the eyes and the hands and things. They're getting a lot better. So yeah, um, yeah very important as Mark's saying their context and critical literacy, super important. Yeah, I mean, think back to what the, you know, the most viral AI generated video, Will Smith eating spaghetti. <laughs> that nightmare of fuel didn't look anything like a human. It was just everywhere. Uh, and it's gotten really, really good. And so I think definitely checking sources. I mean, again, if we look at the source, the most profitable shares is the one that she chose to showcase this. I don't think so. And the link down here is from kxogul.info. I mean, I, I just don't think sh her marketing department would have it like that. I, I don't. It would either come off of the true La Crusette websites as a big announcement or off her own personal socials. So I think going and looking at those sources would be absolutely key. So no longer taking images or video or voice at face value and digging into some more primary sources. Is this replicated somewhere else? Is this a reputable site? Um, so and all that what you're saying, Joe, is nothing new that Correct. we've already been teaching in the classroom. Those are concepts that are tried and true. And we've been teaching that from well before we were ever in the classroom, right? I mean, it's yeah. you're writing and let's just go back to the foundational essay. You have to fact check. You have to check your sources. You can't just take your first source and, and call it for face value. You have to go and, and verify it. Trust, but verify, maybe. Exactly. And, and that's the thing. Like, we live in such a scrolling culture, right? We, we tend to take things at face value, and things don't have to be super sharp to, to, to believe it because we're just scrolling through it. Um, and so, you know, we have to uh, be able to say, okay, let's take our tried and true uh, 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 values of how to identify whether something's true or not and also apply that into our scrolling culture, slow down a little bit. Right. What isn't that what uh, Ferris Bueller says? Let's everybody, we got to slow down a little bit in life. Right. We got to slow down a little bit in our scrolling culture. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, I, and I found this hilarious because I was just talking to somebody at Spring Q about um, uh, it, it, it was Quake, the, the video game Quake. And, and I was saying, man, all these video games you can download now. I remember having to install 20 discs for to install that game Quake, 23 by five discs. And this came out right here. The new edition of Cyberpunk released on uh, 135 yellow floppy disks. Good luck installing these. Now, of course, this is fake. Of course, this isn't real. But the question I have for you is, was this somebody meticulously utilizing Photoshop to make this? Or did they prompt an AI engine to make the background and then use a little bit of Photoshop to make it more cyberpunk? What What do you think? What, what, I mean, because it takes time and effort to make some of these things. For a company now, do you think it's easier just to prompt like mid-journey uh, to be able to make something like this? I would actually hope that somebody has all of those <laughs> in their basement. That would be amazing. That would uh, be epic. <laughs> Um, 
I don't know. Kat, what do you think? I mean, you know, you just like copy and paste, you know, like, I don't know. I think that, you know, this, the shadowing and things really look like to stage this and take a picture of this would be, I think, a little bit tricky for for an amateur. Of course, I I mean, maybe this is, I don't know. Um, it seems like it would take a long time. Yeah. And to, I, to stage it, so I, to speak. I, Christina's camp where I, I really, in, in the, my heart of hearts, I wish somebody saved all these yellow. Like maybe America Online had a yellow <laughs> disc one year and somebody just saved all of them and they said, oh, why not stage this, you know, 20 years later? Um, but I, I tried to emulate this. So I wanted to see whether it was AI generated by if I can go into mid journey and prompt something like this. And in just a few minutes, I mean, I didn't hone it. I didn't do anything. I got something like this in just a few minutes. Um, I think I could have, you know, said something like in a darker room, maybe a, a, a darker desk, you know, maybe I could have said a, a gaming cartridge surrounded by, so I could have adjusted my prompt uh, change the context to, to make it more what I wanted to. But the idea here is it's the same idea, right? And so AI is making it so much easier to make these fakes. And it's fun on April Fool's, but continuing on making these fake things, you know, again, it, it can be scary. Uh, and, and Christina, like you said, we've been teaching students for years to validate sources. Uh, but when it, when it comes to our eyes, it's like, we can't believe our eyes anymore. That's very, that's a very difficult concept to explain to people. Um, hundred you know? percent. But I mean, and this is where I think we value having close partnerships with other organizations that also value that, that critical digital media literacy, um, providing lesson plans and supports for teachers and we we can't ignore it we can't treat it as teaching one more thing it's it has to be integrated as part of the existing curriculum and how do you interweave it thoughtfully meaningfully uh, because the reality is is kids whether they learn it or not in the classroom, they will be exposed to it outside of the classroom. So how are we preparing them and educating them to live outside of what is otherwise a quite protected walled garden yeah. of, of technology? No, hundred um, percent. You know, and, and I was very surprised at how hard it was for me to find examples to share today. Um, and I couldn't tell. There's lots of April Fool stuff out there. Trust me. There was like a sriracha toothpaste, right? Ooh. There was a uh, a hot dog water, sparkling water from Seven Eleven. Um, but <laughs> those all looked too real to be AI. And so I didn't want to bring it on and somebody to say, "Oh, that no, that was real. I was part of that photo shoot. I saw them do it." Um, but I couldn't tell if it was because it was so real. I didn't believe that it could be AI, or if it was real. And that is concerning to me because I was really looking for some fun stuff. And these are the ones that I kind of edged towards possibly AI had a hand in it, but that's an issue. I made one myself. I made oh. one myself. Uh, I, 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 I channeled the Walkman, the Walkman that I had when I was a, a younger lad, right in the nineties, I'm into vinyl records. And so I, I asked, I wonder if they would have a vinyl record Walkman nowadays. It's all the rage now, carry your vinyl records around. And so I went into, uh, I, I went into mid journey for you know, just a little bit and, and made this the vinyl portable Walkman. Uh, and that's supposed to be a, uh, 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 earbuds for, for over your ear. And, and it's supposed to be the size of a record. Uh, so just imagine how big that would be over your head. Um, but I mean, it, it looks like a product that, you know, probably wouldn't exist, but could exist if somebody wanted to make it. It's just so easy to do this. And that just took me a couple minutes. If I honed my prompts and, uh, again, like something like this, I think Mark had a good point. Like, you know, uh, that has to be, uh, Photoshop because the letters are too sharp, but like maybe the background was generated in AI and then they, they did Photoshop to finish it. 
right? Um, and that could be a good skill to have something that's in the background that doesn't have to be as sharp. And then the Photoshopper or artist does the more prominent things. That could be something that is employed more often, right? You know, the coexistence of AI and creativity from the human all at the same time, the mashup, right, is something that, you know, could be very important. Um, but I, I thought it was very important, especially on April 2nd, after April Fool's Day, to talk about how easy it is to fake things now, especially with elections coming up, with misinformation and disinformation coming up, and because our culture is so scroll worthy, and 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 we 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 have to we have to remind our students that social media is something that we need to take really important note of, and that by liking and reposting something that is incorrect or false you are contributing to the uh the 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 progression of false information and it is up to us to say i am not going to like that i am not going to repost that i am not going to engage with it because when i do that the algorithm makes it more important um, and we have to make sure our students understand that that our actions in person and in digital person, they help perpetuate certain things. And we have to make sure our students understand that. So like, think before you like, right? Think before you like, think before you repost. We have that's that sounds like a new poster we should be putting up so. in our in our classrooms, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Um, all right. So I, I want to I want to mention a few things that came out this week and I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, I, I told Kat about this. So, Christina, this may be news to you. Uh, and I confirmed none of these are April Fool's. Some of them sounded like April Fool's. And I confirmed they are real because I didn't want to say that they were real. And then it turns out that I'm I'm the April Fool. Right. So Apple. They released a paper in late March. Uh, so I believe it was March 29th on a new language model that they have been helping create and they are calling it the R E A L M. So realm. And what it is supposed to do, it is supposed to work in tandem with an AI chat bot like Siri. They're going to be upgrading it. And what it does is it takes the context of your ask with the context of whatever's on your screen and puts those together to give you something because it assumes you're talking about something on your screen and it uses that as a context to give the answer. Uh, and they said that they've, they've tested this out and it's working really, really well to me. I'm not surprised, <laughs> excuse me, because from the onset of AI, we've seen Google all in, we've seen Microsoft all in, we've seen Amazon start purchasing up a whole bunch of Anthropics Claude, right? But where was Apple? Where's the Apple? Apple's been slowly and slyly picking up smaller AI companies. And, you know, Kat and I were talking about this. If you're an Appleite, you are probably in. You're all in with Apple. If you have a Mac, that means you have an iPhone, an iWatch, some some iEarbuds or whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry, some ear, Apple earbuds. Um, uh, you probably have an iPad. You're all in. And if your Siri, if they're going to keep calling it that, is attached to all of them, it gets to know you really, really well. And that becomes like your own truly real personal AI assistant. Now incorporate what you're browsing, incorporate what's on your screen. That thing's going to be freakishly good at helping you with things you probably didn't even know you needed help with, right? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Are you surprised that Apple is releasing something like this? Are you surprised to be hearing about it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna jump in when they can and and when they think it's uh, it's, it's appropriate and, and best for their their business and such. Um, the the interesting thing is the what you're talking about with the integration, right? So um, I do have a, a you know personally, I do have a MacBook. I love my um, I love I love the the computers, but I don't I no longer have you know, an Apple watch and, uh, um, and, uh, you know, iPads and all those things, but we're now a Google household. So I'm thinking that really, as you're speaking, because of all this integration, Google knows the voices probably of all the people in my family, 
you know, by Google Home. Uh, it knows our, we have Google, we use Google for the Nest. And so it, it doesn't do a good, a good job of facial recognition, but it's trying to identify members of our family. And so, you know, could this potentially, um, is it very helpful and does it help with uh, being an assistant when we've got all of this integration and it really gets to know us just like social media does that tells us exactly what we want even before we know it? And is that is that really helpful? Yes. But are there also some ethical concerns? And do we also need to think about, hold on, um, are they getting a little too much data from me? So, so I think that it's definitely something we want to have these conversations about, especially with our students, because this is just the first step. I mean, what's next, right? We know that these technologies are going to continue to evolve. Oh, 100%. And I, I do have to give credit to Apple for not being the first or the second in the sense of, I, and I don't know if you've... Um, if you're familiar with Adam Grant's procrastinators, precrastinators uh, work, but he tells this great story. If you haven't listened to his TED talk, I highly recommend it. But he basically says, look, you know, he, uh, the long of the short is his wife now handles all their investments because he basically did not go with Warby Parker because they didn't even have their website up like the day before their presentation was due or something like that. And he's like, but you're an online business and you're not even doing this. And lo and behold, he was like, well, look, there's actually something to be said for procrastination because you're stewing on it. You're thinking about it. You aren't the first you're learning from the first, the second, the third, the fourth, to release a product that might not be new conceptually, but you've been able to work out the flaws. Yeah. So for Apple to be coming in what we might perceive as late to the game, that's that could be a benefit from a business model and an organizational model, right? Um, and so I, I think it's great. Uh, that they're, you know, jumping on in. And in terms of the integration, what comes to mind for me, and this was just coming out of um, an E-rate conversation that took place this morning. I won't bore everybody because we're not going to talk about E-rate and funding, even though we're in the height of E-rate. But, you know, there's a, a request for additional uh, data source validation, something along those lines, right? And so I think about you know, as, as teachers, I remember playing music in class, right? And now it's a lot easier to have, um, say, an Alexa or a Google or whatever speaker in your classroom. I'm really mindful of our, our student data privacy security laws of, of FERPA, for instance, or what have you, right? And so what's what might be happening in the classroom with integrations that are not ill-intentioned. You know, we don't mean anything bad by it, but inadvertently we're further contributing to some student data issues. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because the second bit of information kind of goes along this route. Um, it was just announced. And again, I confirmed none of this is April Fool's everybody. It was just announced. ChatGPT no longer is requiring any login to use their 3.5 model. You can go to chat.openai.com and it's just there. You don't have to log in. You don't have to create an account. You can just start chatting. And they said the reason they did that is because they didn't want having to create an account be a barrier for those that were timid to try it. Um, now, there's pros and cons to that, right? The pro is you can just start chatting, but it's still using what you're putting in as part of the training. And you can opt out of that, but I couldn't find where to opt out of it. I In the article I read before I went to the site, I, I, I it said you can opt out of that and I could not find on that page where you can opt out of not helping train the data. Um, but, but that's, for me, I love it because now when I do a training and I tell people, okay, let's go to ChatGPT and half the room's like, oh, I don't have an account and you have to spend time to get them to do that. Now it's just, boom, let's just get in and play. For me, that's great. But imagine for the classroom now, if the kids go to that site, boom, they don't have no login needed. Uh, this is where AI literacy, AI education truly comes into play. 
even if you're not using AI in the classroom with your kids, again, you know, age limits, uh, COPA, FERPA, all that stuff, you still need to be able to tell them, do not, if you're using these tools, do not put any identifiable student information in here. And please tell your parents not to put any financial information here. I know it's April. I know tax season is here. Please don't put your taxes into these AI chatbots, everybody. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but now, now it levels the playing field. I mean, I think it's a great move by OpenAI because now, you, number one, you're the most adopted uh, ed tech tool in the history of the world, right? And, and 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 now you're opening it up to even more people with a lower threshold to get involved. I mean, that's, I mean, they, they they're doing. And the next thing I want to tell you, they're even going further. So, but I want to hear your thoughts on this well, about data privacy, about use, about accessibility, yeah. about access. So I do want to say one thing, Joe, because you said ed tech tool. Oh which I, I know you don't believe it's an ed tech tool, right? So, but Correct. this is a common thing. I just, I just had this conversation with um, some people that were in business and weren't in education. And they said, what is your, what are some of your concerns about AI in the classroom? And I said, um, well, one of my concerns is that well-meaning, excited teachers who are using these tools that were not designed for education say, oh, I've got a great idea. I can have my students use this. And so they inadvertently break data privacy laws. And, um, and so I think it's really important that we make that distinction that while there are, there are these great tools in the world, um, they're not all made um, to be compliant. Now, that being said, we do know that ed tech companies, like everyone else, they want to get a piece of the pie and they want to have us using their products in schools. So it just is a matter of waiting um, until there are similar tools that are designed for education. And that's coming. I mean, gosh, ISTE, uh, the largest internet, uh, the largest technology, um, educational technology conference in the world is coming in June. And that is when many of these large companies show their new, um, their new updates. And so I am expecting, I can't predict a future, but I would imagine there's going to be a lot of, um, compliant, um, uh, AI integration soon. So um, anyway, that that's my thought on that. Oh, interesting. And uh, Anna or Anna Marie uh, Maria is is talking about an incognito worked for uh, for Chat GPT. So yeah, it's not April Fools. It's here. It's there. Yeah. What are your thoughts, um, Christina? Because I know you um, have a lot. You know, from the equity lens, because I know you do a lot with digital equity and also with the data privacy lens. What is your thoughts on this new update from Chat GPT? Um, obviously, uh, I want to dig into it. I want to learn more about it. And it just, again, heightens the, I don't want to say severity. I think that's too harsh of a word, but it does elevate our need to be mindful on, you can't just throw anything into the classroom and think it's going to be wonderful. Uh, I am still mindful uh, that AI is the the buzzword emerging technology. I think I, you know, we've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll be very curious to see where we are a year from now, and are we still going to be so hyped up over this like we were? with with other tools that came out right when when google apps for education came out when all these other opportunities surfaced for instructional opportunities that make teaching and learning more fun but what's really going to stick um, and how do you integrate it with thought and not just pepper it in whenever you feel like it uh, let's make this real especially for our students, right? I'm, I'm, I just think, you know, having taught high school before, a, a student has what, six, seven, eight teachers. How do we not have students just code switch between so many teachers and expectations and tools and, and, and all that? So let's see where we are a year from now. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because, you know, I, I read an article that says um, the, the AI 
is going to be so ingrained that you're no nobody's going to have to even say with AI or with generative tools. It's going to be expected. Like he says, um, and we have a website. It's expected you have a website, right? It's ex- mm-hmm. ex- it's expected. Um, it, it's 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 just and 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 how fast these things are being amplified and 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 made. It's just astonishing to me. Um, uh, my, my, my fear though, is that these tools are going to be made into plug and play tools where Mm -hmm. we we no longer have to do really anything except press a button. Uh, Mm -hmm. that is my fear. And my fear is that that is the first introduction. A lot of educators are getting are these tools where everything is pre-prompted and everything is pre-made and all you do is press a button and boom, lesson plan, boom, email boom and and my fear is that that's going to become normal and it shouldn't be ai generative ai is not magic it's computer science there is a tactful way of learning it and you need to know the basics of it you need ai education before you should start dabbling in to what i call microwave tools tools that take very little you press a button and you have something serviceable to eat or to use that's so to that, right. So I am all about streamlining for efficiency, right? Like work smart, not hard. Let's let's just let's do things, right? Let's be smart about it. But at the same time, uh, you know, we're we're looking to leveraging technologies to save time. Okay. What else is what else are we doing? Like, what else are we trying to pack our time in with um, if we're looking to save time doing something else? Yeah, you know, we're, we're living in this world of more, 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 do more, more, more. And yet we're so thirsty for a work life balance. And, uh, you know, I, I read an article last week again times are are, you know it's all jumbled but there there is a school district somewhere experimenting piloting a four-day school week for instance right you know we're looking at the the four-hour work day i mean all of this right just to bring in more balance but so that's where my wonder is we're looking to save time but to do what more yeah it's it's like it's like it's it's like having a great drive and getting somewhere early and you're too early to do anything. <laughs> oh, know? but Joe, I have to admit, I mean, when I can play the GPS game and I can I knock love off it. Three no, minutes, I love it. Awesome. I love it. But when I, when I play it too well and you get to the hotel and they're like, Oh, your room's not going to be ready for two hours. It's, it's like, so, why, did yeah. I, <laughs> why did I do it? You know, it's like, I, I used to watch Dharma and Greg, right. And there was this great supermarket episode where they're you know walking through the supermarket and it's like oh we have the pre-shelled green beans already oh whatever will we do with our time now that we don't have to do you know shell the peas i think that's the same thing here again i'm all about efficiency and streamlining and making things easier but when we say oh well we want to save time well okay to To do do what what? to do so hopefully to create more engaging activities in the classroom Right. And more more collaborative activities, the extension activities we always say we don't have time for. Hopefully yeah. that's the time we can Hopefully. we can gain. Hopefully. That's what we want. That's what we want. It's true, though, that so I uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say it out loud now. I read headlines. I don't always read the whole article. I know that's not. Um, but I also don't tell people this is truth because I know <laughs> I just read the headline. But I read a headline about somewhere um, where they were considering. um trying to like mandate that employees discon- are are allowed to disconnect right because what i'm thinking about what we're ta- what you're talking about with oh we're going to save all this time because we're going to have all this efficiency but then are we going to then say oh well look at how much more teachers can do with these tools so we'll just give them more things to do <laughs> and then that work life balance, yeah. which I call to work life fusion, but like you're saying, Christina, what's that going to do to us? So I think that's one thing to consider, but if you do have more time, I would encourage you to integrate computer science as Joe was speaking about. Um, the reason I say that is similar to what Joe is saying. I am, my other fear about AI is in education is that 
if we, um, if it's so simple and so easy that we don't know how it works, that we, we don't realize, oh, we need to prompt away the bias. Oh, we need to actually ask it specific questions that require us to have some expert knowledge on something, to have some content knowledge, right? So, so I do have a concern that, um, that yes, the more that it becomes automated, then we don't see, you know, what those impacts are and what, how it's made. And then, and then it's harder for us to actually evaluate it. So, um, so I would agree with you on that one. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and there's, this there's, there's, I mean, so much we can have with that conversation, but there's one more, one more piece of information I want to share with you before we close out. Okay. So it's no secret that Microsoft and open AI are hand in hip or hand in hand, hip to hip, something like that. They're together. Right. Um, and they have been creating supercomputers all across the United States. Um, and they just announced that they are uh, in the final phase of building their fifth supercomputer. And they have titled it the Stargate. And uh, it, it is rumored that this is one of the largest computers uh, and advanced computers in the world. Uh, and it's going to require several hundred acres of land and five gigawatts of power to run. Now, I want to remind everybody in 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 the, in the stream that it took 1.21 gigawatts for the DeLorean to travel back in time. Okay, and so what can this Stargate do with five gigawatts of power? Okay, uh, so. Uh, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. They've, they've been building these supercomputers across the U.S. to power their most powerful models. Uh, and it's been rumored that, uh, that GPT-5 will be released by the end of this year. Uh, so could they be connected? Could we be in an era of the Stargate? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Like part of me just wants to, you know, live in the world of Outlander and live like just time travel, you know, like do the back and, you know, back to the future, like, you know, Marty McFly. But um, maybe does this mean time travel is, is possible to just make it happen? I don't know. I won't get into that part. I, I would I totally mean. love to like go back in time. Or even go into the future at some point. That would be so fun. Can't but be I, 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 I want to point out. I, I want to point out. The article did not mention the DeLorean. I just wanted to point out the DeLorean only took 1.21 gigawatts of power. This one takes five. So okay, so it's saying. Bill and Ted's elevator instead. There you go. I mean, there let's you go. Do this. Kat, what do you think? So, so when Joe told me this, um, what it made me think of is. I am a, I love technologies advancements. I, I, I love to see innovation, all of these things, but I am starting to learn more and more and notice that as Joe was saying, the amount of energy and natural resources that are utilized for these technologies is often not publicized. And so I think it is important that we start to talk about these things. We start to build some awareness because the, like these huge data centers that store everything that we have in the cloud and we don't even think about because, well, it's gone. Like it's no big deal. Well, it is. It's taking a huge amount of space and it's taking a lot of energy and they have tons of what tons figuratively, there's probably more than tons, but they've all this water that's like cooling these centers and things. So, uh, you know, and I'll admit, like, I, I only know the tip of the iceberg probably about this, like the environmental impacts, but I think it's just something that we should start delving into and really starting to learn about what, what really are the impacts? There's, there's impacts in computing all over the place, right? So when we're talking about AI, yes, it's about our kids going to cheat, right? I know that's something everyone's on. And I'm not saying that that's not something we got to think about because what does that mean? How should we assess, right? That that's important, but there's other things too. You know, Mark in the chat was talking about 
Are there going to be employees laid off with um, more efficiency? Is there, are we going to have, um, we're, we're like not even going to notice that there's bias in these, in these machines anymore because we just push a button. Like, so, so just, just all, all the things, all the impacts. I think it's important to just have the conversations, just have the conversations with each other, with our students and become more informed because we're in this digital world. We're not, it's not, I mean, unless Christina, Christina, you said, you're just going to go, go out and, and live in the country and you know, that's fine. You want to, you want to disconnect and that that's cool. Um, but I still want to live in the digital world. So I want to try to become as informed as I can uh, while I'm living here. Yeah. And, you know, at least at least the benefit is if things do go haywire, there's always the Stargate we can take back in time and fix things. Right. I guess that's the uh, the thing. Um, but th these are some phenomenal points uh, about the impact of technology on uh, natural resources. Right. On 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 everything. And and these are things that are not being talked about. Right. Um, and and I and I want I want to be mindful of everybody's time. It is 444. We have about a minute left. I want to be mindful that for a lot of schools right now, um, we are moving into state testing month. Right. Uh, April, May is when a lot of schools start scheduling that. And we have to put this in our brain. We don't need to have a conversation about it right now, but put this in your brain. The state testing your students are going to be taking is before AI was brought into the world. So what does that mean about testing after AI? Um, because I asked an AI chatbot that exact same question. And it told me, do not put progress in a straitjacket. And I thought that was a phenomenal statement from a machine that is not real. So I just wanted to end it with that. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Kat, as always, thank you for being here. Uh, audience, uh, thank you. 62 uh, concurrent audience members at the moment. That's phenomenal. We do this every month, everybody. We normally do this every second Tuesday. This is an early one because we do have some members who are going to be on vacation next week, but we wanted to bring it to you. Please ask us questions. We will put them live on the air if you're here in person, but we also want you to ask them throughout the month. QLearns.org slash A-I-E-E-A-A-O. Tell your friends Tell your family, tell your family pets. This show is happening every month. We'd love to have you. We'd love to see you live and in person. This show was produced by real people for real people. So until next month, until May, until May the 4th be with you. We hope that you all have a phenomenal, phenomenal April. So thanks, everybody. Have a great, great month.